Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, as Floor says, uh, my name is Helen Gould, and I work at an organisation called Nesta. Uh, the simplest way of explaining Nesta is to say that we finance and support public and social innovation. And for the last, I guess, actually nearly four years, we've been really interested in the collaborative economy in all of its forms. Um, but today, and very briefly, I just wanted to talk about something quite specific. So, a very well-known social research agency in the UK regularly conducts an opinion poll with 30,000 households. And one of the questions in that survey says, which of these issues do you think are most important? And it has things like unemployment, education, crime, uh, public health, etc., etc. Climate change has ranked so consistently low in all of the responses to that survey that now they don't bother asking that question anymore because the results are so insignificant. Now, one conclusion that you might draw from that is that we don't care about climate change. And really, we don't. Most people don't care and or they don't believe it's an issue they need to be concerned about. A lot of people can't care because, quite frankly, they're dealing with far nearer term challenges to their well-being, making focusing on something like worrying about climate change as being something huge, distant and almost impossible. Some people care very deeply about climate change, but very fleetingly. In the same way they might care deeply and fleetingly about the fact they're going to die one day. You know, you get taken to quite a dark, cold place, you look at something pretty horrible, you don't like what you see, uh, and then you sort of close your eyes and you start thinking about what you might have for tea and other things. Some people um, care consistently and deeply and worry quite a lot about climate change and then totally fail to make any kind of meaningful change, meaningful change in their lives that's proportionate to the concerns that they feel. And I fall into that category, and I would imagine that quite a few of you do too, making an assumption. Now, really, what choices of sustainability do we have? So, um, if you, despite what we've heard today, um, you know, even the most progressive of governments, even the most progressive corporate organisation has been glacially slow to move to any kind of sustainability. And for too many years, we have been engaged in this sort of Frankenstein-like task of stitching sustainability onto existing business and economic models. And I think the results speak for themselves. And Robin's talk scares the hell out of me, I have to say. But that the collaborative economy represents an opportunity to um, reimagine how we produce, consume, get rid of the things that we need to live is a really compelling idea. And I think here and in other pockets of the world, you can kind of stand and look at a vision. You can see what it might become, see how this world could be a much more sustainable place. But quite frankly, um, whether that journey towards sustainability is long or short, there's no doubt in my mind that we're going to reap some pretty harsh consequences for everything that we've done to the planet already. Now, whether these are short, sharp emergencies that demand immediate kind of coordinated response, like floods or extreme weather events, um, earthquakes, um, hurricanes, or whether those are more longer-term societal crises that come about a result of a community and a society becoming much more strained and stressed about the resources that it has available to it. Now, no one is immune um, from climate change, and we will all be affected with it. And, of course, there is a fairly well-developed, if imperfect, global infrastructure for dealing with um, emergencies and catastrophes. So everything from uh, the Disasters Emergency Committee to the UN to central and local governments and municipalities, they all have um, plans for dealing with uh, contingency and disasters. We have not-for-profit sector, you have NGOs and, uh, of course, aid organisations and, of course, the military. And I'm certainly not arguing that we don't need that infrastructure. In fact, if we accept for a minute that these events, these extreme events, are going to become more frequent, then those resources are going to become more drilled, thinly drawn over time. I'm not suggesting we don't need that. That's a completely necessary thing. But with the rise of open data, with the rise of collaborative uh, platforms, particularly platforms 
that share identity, location, and inventory. We are building a sort of um, a social technological infrastructure that could considerably strengthen our resilience and responsiveness in times of emergency. Now, in the last few years, you will have seen that there's been a large number of quite uh, specific tools for coping with disasters and crises. So you have um, ShakeAlert, which is the app that gives you a minute's warning um, for when an earthquake is going to hit. Now, a minute isn't long, but it could potentially be life-saving. Outside um, the city in Rio, you have um, a distributed sensor network that tracks rainfall in the countryside, and then they can predict three days in advance where and when you will see flash flooding in the city. You've got open source uh, sensors and devices like Arduino, Smart Citizen Kit, things like Propeller Health, all in the business of mapping and aggregating environmental data, enabling new kinds of knowledge, enabling new kinds of behaviors, and agency to take action. You have, um, of course, in uh, Fukushima, you, following the nuclear power plant catastrophe, um, was developed Safecast, which is a way of crowdsourcing radiation levels across the country, arguably giving a much clearer and transparent picture about the diffusion of radiation levels across that country. And although you've got a load of specific platforms that are being used and developed for um, for specifically responding to disasters, of course, we've already built a fantastic infrastructure that could be bent towards that need. So if you look at in the wake of things like bombings and riots and floods and other things, you'll see now that people now intuitively and instinctively take to technology to find out what's happening, where do I go, how do we coordinate efforts. You see it use of Twitter a lot. But if you look at things like collective awareness platforms, like things like Local Mind and Foursquare, look at what they're being used for today. So they might use them to find out where my friends are. I might use them to, uh, who around here do I know? Where can I get a cup of coffee around here? Is that table free in that restaurant that I really like? Oh, he's quite nice. You know, there's lots of uses for these things that are uh, interesting, but let's not kid ourselves that they're incredibly trivial uh, use of what is an incredibly powerful concept and infrastructure. When you had the strike um, in San Francisco last year, you had ventures like um, uh, Sidecar and Liquid Space opened up uh, their platforms, enabling people across the city to reroute their lives, find different places to work, find different modes of transport to get across the, the uh, city. Now, a strike is a minor inconvenience compared to a sort of a, a, an environmental disaster. But when you look at how the potential there, it's pretty huge. So when you had Airbnb hosts, 1,400 of them, opening up their doors to take in people who had been made homeless from Hurricane Sandy, uh, that was incredibly powerful too. Now, I'm not in any way suggesting... Um, excuse me, my throat's really dry. Uh, I'm not suggesting uh, that taking, into, taking somebody into your house and giving them safe haven is a new idea. I'm not suggesting that we're reinventing civil society or reinventing human compassion, but that idea that you can now turn a key and release an inventory of thousands and thousands of relevant resources that considerably are there on demand in real time to help people in need, that is new. And when you saw that happen again in the Somerset flooding uh, in the UK earlier this year, again you had Airbnb opening up their doors, letting people in and provide them with homes. And you also overnight, Task Hub developed uh, the flood volunteers platform which allowed thousands of people, thank you, <laughs> excuse me, allowed thousands of people uh, to channel their help towards people in need. Now, again, that desire to help, that human impulse, it really isn't new, but that ability to match individuals' pluck cries for help and need in a specific location and match them with the people who have the time, resources, and skills to help in a disintermediated, peer-to-peer -peer way, that is incredibly powerful. Now, we could take 
a stand on this, really, and make some kind of commitment. And everybody that's here who's engaged in a platform that connects communities together in any form, whether they're, and whether they're involved in connecting wants and needs in a community or supply and demand in a city, and however they're involved, they should, I believe, make some kind of plan or commitment, public maybe, for how they would respond in the time of a great emergency that would affect the people who they work with on a day-to-day -day level. Now, just to close, this isn't a um, particularly new idea. In San Francisco last year, you saw the emergence of the Sh Sharing Economy Disaster Preparedness Partnership. That was a partnership between uh, the city of San Francisco and uh, Bayshare, who together have tasked themselves with generating a plan for how they would respond uh, to an emergency in their city uh, in the event that government resources uh, might be difficult, if not impossible, to maintain. Now, that partnership isn't maybe that surprising. You have a very large community of enlightened and progressive entrepreneurs sitting on top of the San Andreas Fault. This is, you know, it's a logical thing to be starting to think about. But that model, that model where the sharing economy could become an explicit and even formal part of the overall plans and infrastructure for responding to crises, that's a really neat idea, I think, and very clearly is a model that could be replicated in every city across the world, given the right kind of leadership and commitment. So thank you very much.